Hey everyone, welcome to, to Publishing Your Own Tabletop Game. Uh, we are here with an amazing group of creators, publishers, and know-it-alls from the industry. Uh, we're gonna, <laughs> I mean, what else would you guys be if you weren't here? Uh, we're gonna go over uh, who everyone is real quick, and then we're gonna jump into the meat of the panel. First off, I would like to introduce Michael Coe, the CEO of Gameland Games and co-creator of the Tiny Epic series. Hi, Meredith. Thank you for having me on the panel with these esteemed guests. Yes, uh, I am Michael Coe, founder of Gameland Games, CEO and uh, co-creator of the Tiny Epic series. So that's probably how you, everybody knows Gameland Games. Uh, Tiny Epic has kind of been our thing for a long time. We, we first uh, started with Tiny Epic Kingdoms in 2014, and that's really been the focus of our company uh, ever since. And we've uh, kickstarted every one of the tiny epic games. So we have a lot of experience in the Kickstarter field and uh, what it's all about trying to cram as much game into as small of a package as possible. And we've got it down to a, a science. Uh, so that's uh, really kind of what it's all about for us. And I'm just happy to be here so that I can share some of uh, what I've learned on this hectic journey, but also very rewarding journey. So thank yeah, you for having me. There's a lot of art in those games as well as the science of getting a lot in those boxes. So. That's Every one of them is a, is a passion project. Thank you. Thank you, Z. That's awesome. Uh, T from game, or the Games Channel Manager of Haba. What exactly does a Games Channel Manager do? Uh, a lot. Uh, so I am the Games Channel Manager for Haba USA here in the United States. Um, and what that means is basically I am in charge of the games division for the USA. Actually, it's technically North America. I handle Canada and Mexico as well. Um, for Haba, which is a German toy and games company, um, they're 82 years old. Uh, and they, um, if you grew up in Germany, you know Haba. Uh, it's the yellow box, they're everywhere. Um, the neighbor's getting a roof repaired, so sorry about that. <laughs> so good. Um, <laughs> um, I'm just happy she's getting the roof repaired. After rain season's a weird time, but it's fine. Um, so anyway, yeah, um, so I handle a lot. Um, I am in charge of what gets imported into the US from Germany, but I also work with the German team in regards to figuring out games development and that kind of stuff and then what would make sense in the US market versus not. Um, and then I help with the translation and proofing and then sales and marketing and distribution and all that fun stuff. So yeah. <laughs> just a few things, just a, just a few. <laughs> all right, John, uh, you're the founder and now director of creative of Alderic Entertainment Group. How do you go from starting a company to, I guess, taking on your dream job of not having to run the company? <laughs> So um, I ended up getting very lucky and I hired people who were better at each job at the company than I am. And then I recognized that I was more in the way than I was um, solving problems. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I graduated into a position where I pretty much focus 100% on finding the very best games for us to publish. And then we put those games into the, the, into the framework and system that we created at AEG and uh, you know, making, picking great games is the first and most important thing that you will do as, as you know, in your journey to be a great game publisher, I think. That's fantastic. And finally, we have Julie, the VP and COO of Greenbuyer Games. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your company. Hi. Yeah. So we started in 2012 and were the kind of at the beginning of the Kickstarter craze. So that's a big part of our initial success was the proverbial group of friends who decided they were gonna design a game and hey, maybe we should publish it. Maybe we should be publishers, I don't know. And then decided, yes, we were. It worked for us, but there have been a lot of interesting things along the way that have happened <laughs> that I've learned from and mistakes that I've made that I hope I can help other people avoid. Um, I'm also on the Gamma board and I also do a show that has we've done since we can't go to conventions and apparently that means I have to add more to my plate called You're Invited, which is every Friday. Rachel Blasky, uh, who, you know, was uh, the Mint 10 series uh, of games that I do a weekly uh, 
it's a podcast, but with video. <laughs> it's a great anyway, show. Is what it is. <laughs> Thank you. That is basically for if you're a small business owner specific, more catered towards game publishers and you're new and you're shiny and you're looking for things to do, how do you do them? And what questions should you be asking? And it's okay to cry. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's like the key for 2020 into 2021. It is okay. Yeah, there's no crying. There's no crying. It's crying all the time. Oh I God. don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I cried this morning. <laughs> Mainly because we finally have carpet in our office, which is awesome. <laughs> Here's some joy. Yay! Hey, all right. Okay, so we're here to talk about publishing games, uh, albeit something I know uh, very little about. I just like to play them. So uh, I, I guess, where do you even start publishing a game? How, how does one even go about that? <laughs> With a dream and your parents' money is where we go. <laughs> fair. Very oh. fair. <laughs> oh goodness. Uh my parents, I by the time I started, my parents were like, no, you've you're out of dreams. Sorry. You fund your <laughs> you own dreams. All those checks already. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, you know, where do you start is the smart thing to do is have a business plan. Um, I don't think a lot of board game publishers probably followed that advice because we're also very creative people so that's the challenge is how do you find a good in between and the the upside of getting into the industry now is there are a lot of small independent publishers and there's a lot of ways that you can find out well what did you do what did you what worked for you what didn't work for you and do some research do some research before you just dive in i know like a lot of things are passion projects and people do them for love and that's awesome but don't mortgage your house for it is right. all i'm gonna say about that yeah no it starts with the inspiration and and a, and a goal right a goal of uh, you know especially if you're at the very very beginning if this is like your first game right i mean it's, it's at that point you're so new to everything and, and there, there's so much to learn, but there's, there's a lot of inspiration there and there's a goal for what you want people to feel when they play your game. And you may draw similarities to other games that you've played that have inspired you. Uh, but, if, but if you have that goal in mind of this is the experience I'm going for, for the people who, who are willing to sit down and even give my game the time of day, I want them to feel this or that, right? And that's a great place to start. Uh, of course, it's very broad, but, but from there you can start uh, narrowing it down and seeing and kind of chipping away at things that are getting further from the experience you're desiring and getting closer to what you're, you're looking for. And, and uh, of course, that's a, a, like you said, there's a lot of heart in that, but I think that's where a lot of people start. They, they want to share an emotion of some sort through the avenue of, of gaming. I mean, I feel like when I went to Gamma uh, for the first time before the pandemic, there were so many people on that opening night, just uh, even with beta versions of their game, kind of handing them out and, and getting people to play. And I will say that those who had the most passion about their games, even if they fumbled over their words trying to explain it to me, uh, they caught my attention because you could tell this was something that they cared deeply about. Yeah, I think that Gamma is a um, is a great place for someone to start if they are interested in more traditional, an, a, an old time traditional path to publishing games. So the old time path was is that you would go to a Gamma show and you would learn about distribution and retail and and the the, the three tier mar three tier market and how it worked. Um, this is all about the business side, not about the creative side. I'm a big believer in you have to have a game that you believe in before you do any of this stuff. But um, uh, to get into the standard business side, I guess my recommendation would be to go to the Gamma Trade Show. And if you want to do the Kickstarter side of the business, um, there are so many online forums and articles and people who have shared their experiences out there. There's just no, no limit to the information that you can get um, from people who have succeeded and failed before you. Um, so you should be able to get yourself armed with a lot of information to be able to do this well. 
Yeah. There's lots and lots of podcasts. There's forums. There's video series. Um, there's this saying that I will butcher entirely, which is stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, there is no reason why if you're trying to publish a game either independently or through a publishing house, there's no reason that you should have to figure something out from scratch. Like there are lots and lots of resources out there. Um, so many, and I want to start listing them, but I don't know, like cardboard yeah, Edison, please, please listen. Uh, so Cardboard Edison has a great collection and they kind of okay. aggregate a okay. lot of things from a lot of different pod podcasts and um, written articles. So they're really a great resource and they have it divided by like the different stages of even development uh, all the way to publishing and then the like marketing part. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, oh, was it James? James did a whole series on how- uh, James Daffy? Yeah, or was it-, or is it Hudson. I don't remember. There was a James that did a series on how his game got to development and things like that. Um. <laughs> I would say both of them. James Matthew is, you know, is is quite a bit. The, the series is a little bit older, but there's still quite a lot of relevant information. And James Hudson has ongoing information that he also shares. Yes, but he, yes. And James has, I was specifically thinking of his vlog series that he did back yep. for the Grim Forest Kickstarter back yep. before he started working with Skybound. So that's just the top of mind, but there's been podcasts made about this for years uh, and how to market and do all that kind of stuff. So, well, so many, so many resources. Well, to that point, uh, for people watching this panel at, at home, what would you guys say your opinions on going with an independent publisher, self-publishing, or trying to seek a larger publisher? I'd love to hear each of your thoughts on on what your feelings are for people to, or, or even maybe the differences, maybe not what people should do, but what are the differences for, of each and the, and the advantages and disadvantages of each? Sure, this is something that I, I definitely tackled in the beginning days. When I uh, had an idea to get into the board game space, I thought it would be that I would design a game and, and sell it to a publisher and then maybe design another one and continue down that route. And I ended up going the route of just publishing games myself. But that's because the, the business side of it actually sounded interesting to me and it sounded like a fun challenge to me. But that's not everybody. And, it, and if figuring out logistics and taxes and nowadays uh, VAT and, uh, you know, and just running the Kickstarter and managing the Kickstarter, finding a manufacturer, finding a fulfillment company, finding distributor. If that doesn't sound fun or all that interesting and you're like, look, I just, I just know how really cool mechanics work and I have this really cool idea when you take these cards and they do these things and these dice and they do these things. And that's kind of what I, all I really think is fun. All the rest is really not that fun to me then just then just focus on what you enjoy and what's fun but but for me i kind of was somewhat intrigued uh by that by that the business end of things and so uh so then i ended up going the route of kickstarter and kickstarting my own game and i had to kickstart several of my own games before i got to the point where i felt comfortable opening up as a publisher to accept games from other designers and i'll, and I'll go kind of what john said at some point i felt like my own games were just not, uh, I just, I just wasn't, uh, I just didn't, I wasn't the best at game design, but I loved the idea of all the things that happened around it. And so I wanted to bring people in that were more talented, more naturally, it just came to them more natural to design a game and, and understand the engineering that goes behind the systems of a game. Uh, and, and so then I opened up to accepting submissions from other designers, but I had to kind of prove myself before I felt like anybody would take me serious. So I, I kickstarted and self-published a, a couple of titles. And then, and then that's when Scott Alms uh, submitted a game to me that became Tiny Epic Kingdoms and started the whole Tiny Epic series. And I found I was really able to um, let a lot of the creativity that, that, that I enjoy come out through development, not designing, uh, but then also I could just tackle the business side of things. So if business doesn't sound fun, then, then design a game and look for an, a publisher. But if for some reason you're weird and you like the business and the, the mundane weird stuff of business, then look to publish yourself through Kickstarter. Michael, it's so weird. You just told my, your, my whole journey. That's just so weird. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of us that, that share that exact story. Like I, almost word for word. That was eerie. I was like, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> like the whole time, that, but that's, and that is the challenge. I think knowing that about yourself is also hard to find out without trying it. But then if you try it, so, so, you know, having a good idea of, do you, do you want to be, you know, there's a lot of facets to being a small business owner. Um, and some of it is terrifying and some of it's so exciting and some of it is very mundane, you know, laundry and taking out the trash, kind of looking at spreadsheets and little boxes. And for some people, that's amazing. Um, <laughs> how it all works and how it all fits together and have you gotten it in in time? And, ooh, I forgot that email, but I remembered it and I got it in before they even noticed that I missed, I, I that, that they thought I was missing it. That can be gamified too, if, or at least, you know, like, but if it's not your thing, it is hard to, it's a, it's a grind. Hard to, um, hard to, hard to fake it. It's hard and to it fake is it. very hard to fake it. Um, I love running a business. I'm not, not that it isn't scary sometimes and not that it isn't sometimes there are the days where you're like, I just don't want to do this thing. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to follow up on that back and forth negotiation, but then there are the days where you're like, oh, you know, if I changed this component to this component, let me check with the manufacturer and see what the cost is for that. And how does that change the weight of my game? And, and, and if that's exciting, then you're probably a publisher. Also, if you're willing to deal with customer service, uh, yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you yeah. Have to love customer service, you really do. Yeah, so I have a friend who is a designer who did independent publishing for a little while and then sold a game to a publisher, and he was like, "I'm never going back to independent publishing because he realized his favorite part of game development and selling a game and publishing a game was when he would get to go to a convention." or a show or, or any sort of thing and teach his game. It, whether it was a play test or if it was a published thing, that's all he really wanted to do was he wanted to teach the game to people and play it. And it turns out that if you are doing independent publishing, there's a lot more involved than just teaching people your game. It's not all fun, you know, situations of like, oh, well, what if we did, what if we did dinosaur meeples dinosaur meeples are so hot right now what if we did dinosaur meeples <laughs> with like a thing and a thing in that park and all oh, that is so cool like that's a fun part of publishing but then you're sitting there going oh the dinosaur meeples are one millimeter too long and they no longer fit in the box yes like uh, that's the and somebody part. emails you and says you said that there were going to be chartreuse dinosaur meatballs and this i'm holding it up to the light and this is clearly just a plain emerald green yeah. and i need to share my feels about it on all of social media <laughs> yeah and you're gonna send me a replacement copy with the correctly painted meatballs or the dinosaur meatballs are only one millimeter long like like <laughs> the ones in tiny epic dinosaurs and they all arrive broken and then it's just like, what in the world? <laughs> oh, I, had a, I didn't mean to hit a sore subject with the dinosaurs. I just, they're so popular right now. Uh, I was laughing because I know. Are the new the cats. Yeah. They sort of are. Yeah. yeah. So, yes, you have to also fully embrace that part of it. Um, I like to thank all of my years of being an elementary school teacher for having the patience for that and the right tone <laughs> for responding to people. Um, Both paths are, are difficult, right? So yeah. the, 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 I'm going to run my own business, the launch a Kickstarter. There are, there are a lot of things that you have to learn in order to do that. And if you want to get your game published through a, a game company, there's, you still have to be a good salesperson and a good, you know, you have to be sort of tenacious about making relationships and finding the right people to pitch to and making sure that, you know, you're, you're, connecting with that person on a regular basis. You have to um, you have to listen to feedback from publishers, but not listen to them so much that you change your sort of dream and vision for your, for, for your, for your game. Um, so if you publish it on your own, you're sort of free to make the game that you want to make, but you're also free to make the mistakes that that publisher has learned, you know, what not to do. But um, uh, I have learned in, you know, in recent years that um, uh, 
that the things that I've learned over 28 years are just not correct. I have new people that we're doing business with who, you know, have come in and said, you know, we're going to do this. And, and myself and my partner, Ryan, are like, oh, that's a mistake. We definitely shouldn't do that. And a year later, we're in our meeting and we're saying, we should start doing things the way they're doing that. That worked out really well. We need to learn from that, that, that experience. Education is ongoing. I love it. Oh, the other, oh, no, go on, say, the other thing with when you submit a game to a publisher and the publisher is going to publish it, um, you have a lot of conversation and, and you kind of have to advocate for your game or your vision in a way that you don't have to do if, if you're doing it all yourself. Um, you have to do a lot of justification talk potentially. But the other thing is, is that you have to have a lot more patience sometimes because publishers can be very slow depending on the size of the publisher the the amount of time you get put into a release cycle they have basically an internal machine that is going to run and it's going to run on the timeline that it runs at and you just have to buckle up and sometimes that means that you'll go very quickly and sometimes it means you just haven't heard from them for three weeks so it really can three be weeks. I would, <laughs> you guys are like awesome. three weeks. Oh yeah, no. Well, I was being generous. Three. Yeah, we're we're about six months, really. Um, but uh, yeah. So when you put, when you give, I'll just say, it, when you submit your game to Haba, we get over a thousand game submissions a year. Um, because it's Haba, it's Germany, right? It's this big, big brand, and some of those submissions are like a mom came up with a fun game to play with her four-year-olds, right? And they submitted it. And then sometimes the submissions are like from Michael Kiesling. And it's just like a bunch, it's a thousand submissions that is just a mix of that. And they all get treated kind of with the same equal footing through the machine. And that takes a lot of time. And so when you're submitting to a publishing company, it it's not as fast paced as an independent or a small indie uh, publisher with maybe two employees. If you're talking about a big, company it's like we're gonna get back to you when we get back to you like we've got other pots stirring and, et cetera, and john et said something about that too that as you uh if you are a designer who decides you're just trying to pitch your game to publishers taking the time to know which of your designs is a good fit for which company is also key because being tenacious is one thing being tenacious with an actual plan of what's a good fit is something else. Um, because I've had tenacious designers where I'm like, have you even seen my my games? They're all horror themed, narrative driven, and you gave me a dexterity, brightly colored. Can you send that one game, to me? Right? I'll give you the horror games. Yeah. <laughs> I did once, I did once. I literally did that once. I was actually thinking, referencing a specific design that I looked at it, I was like, Haba is right over there. Um, because and he was like, well, yeah, I know. But I was like, what games do we make? Yeah. And and, and that's an important question. Or as a poor young designer said, yeah. I was just saying, that's an important question. Oh, no, question. I, I, I oh, can yeah. stop. Oh no worries. I don't mean to. I don't mean to interrupt. I just want to. Um, I, I feel like I, I'm in lieu of us actually having an audience to ask questions. I'm going to kind of be that representative and and say I, I have a game and and you know it's in its design stage and I want to bring it to a publisher. Um, you know, it is important to know who's going to best publish my game. Um, and and say I'm going out and seeking that. What's the best way to go about approaching someone to publish a game? Um, my like very how favorite was Christopher yeah. Chung. Uh, he, I was actually play testing one. I was at a uh, board game cafe in Canada. I was visiting some people, and he was play testing uh, a design that he had for another publisher, um, and asked people to to play test. He didn't know me from a hole in the wall, but I was like, "Oh yeah, cool," and played it, gave feedback. Apparently my feedback was real specific because he then was like, wait, who are you? <laughs> and looked up my company and the next day found me and said, hi, I see that you're from Greenbrier Games. You've published this, this, and this, and they have these kinds of themes. And I have this design that is a two player, like serial killer versus the cops that I think would be a perfect fit for your company because... Yeah, that is um, that, that is an excellent story because 
I think that um, there are probably you know, two or 300 companies that could publish your game. Um, but it's my knowledge that almost none of those companies take blind submissions in a way that you would think would be productive for you. So getting you know, a, a thousand submissions in a year via, via our blind submission inbox, uh, up until a year and a half ago, we didn't have anyone who was dedicated to go through that blind submission inbox. And so I think maybe in the first 20 years that we were in business, we published one game from a blind submission. Um, uh, and now we have a now we have a system for going through all of those, and we we're, we're we're much better at it. We have a forum for talking to designers, but um, most companies do not have that 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 opportunity. That like if they're a small to medium sized company, all the people in that company wear a whole bunch of hats, including being the the people who sort of figure out what their next game is going to be. Um, and if they're a big company, they get so many submissions, and they have so many layers for a, for a game to go through. Um, it, 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 is, it, is, it is difficult. And yeah. my advice to a designer who has a game that wants to find a publisher is um, do a little bit of research as to what the process is for the companies that you're pitching to, right? Like if you're gonna send in a blind submission, um, start with, you know, can I know who I'm sending this to? What your process is? Do you have rules on the internet that I should, that I should be following? Um, you know, follow up in a polite but not um, uh, not confrontational manner, right? Like, um, just remind people that you're there, and um, and and hopefully you'll get an answer. And when you get an answer that you don't that you don't like, just restart the process again with a different publisher or on a different date. Yeah. The other option is a lot of companies um, that are larger sizes or smaller sizes will occasionally do events specifically around taking pitches or they'll participate in events that are around taking pitches. So for example, Nunpub or Un Unpub is a um, show that's all about playing prototype games and they often have events at the larger conventions. Like they have an event at Origins, they have an event at um, Gen Con. And uh, as part of those events, publishers are invited to go and play test games there and also potentially participate or take pitches. Um, there are speed dating events that publishers will sign up for to take pitches at. Um, and so a lot of conventions or trade shows are starting to have where publishers will go and participate to take pitches to kind of skip that blind um, submission form. I know at Haba, we do that. We, uh, this year, I mean, 2020, the last 12 months have been very unique in that regard, but um, we always have, so we take submissions and you can kind of skip the blind submission box if you're at those physical shows, which I know is not something that everybody can do, but with virtual conventions, it's becoming more common to have virtual pitch meetings. And for those sorts of events, I know there's like another nun pub happening in like three weeks or something. Um, I'd also like to just give a shout out, uh, Carla, Weird Giraffe Games every Sunday hosts a pitch practice where she has three guest publishers listen to your pitch and give you feedback. And it's also a sneaky way for me to listen to pitches. And if I find something without them actually, without actually getting sell, sold to, where I could be like, that was, let me give you some feedback. Also, let me have your email. Yeah. <laughs> Does Haba still run their game design contest? I think have gotten a, a, a lot of pitches from designers who are like, oh, my game was a finalist in the Haba game design contest, or I won the Haba game design contest. And, Nice. We are. Yes. The fifth annual game design contest. Uh, we're going to start opening the kits for that this week or next. So when this, when this is live, I think it'll be live as well. And we're doing some fun stuff this year. So That's yeah, exciting. That's awesome. that is one of the ways we, uh, Haba does a family friendly game design contest. We open it up every year. Um, it's us only sadly, but, um, that is one of the ways that we kind of, uh, open up uh, so that you can skip the blind box, but it is, uh, you have to do a design using the, whatever the contest's uh, theme or pieces are that year. So 
that's an example of if you researched our company, you would find this is one way to kind of go. And we've had people that have submitted designs that are clearly well, more, way more thought out than the design contest time. And they had the design and then they just kind of like tweaked it to make it work with the contest, mm -hmm. which I'm not, I, that's fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm not bothered by that. <laughs> but so from Haba, which is a very established, it, so this is kind of a note, if you want to be a publisher, and you want to start looking for game designs, having on your social media website, whatever you have a, a itinerary of what games you're looking for will also save you a lot of heartache on the publisher end of things, because that's, we have, we take two different types of games. If you go to our website and it's, a, you know, contact us right under contact us is if you are a designer and it says, if it's a, we want a dark thematic game here, if, if it has five of the bullet of the total bullet points of suggestions we have, please submit it. Or if you want part of our cute but stabby line here's a bullet point of what that means if there you have at least five of those bullet points send it in and once you send it in here are the steps we will take here's and so that we don't so that as a designer there i mean you can ask and usually when we ask i, I say here please refer to the handy thing i wrote out very thoughtfully rather than me trying to shoot you an email real quick in the middle of the day okay, you know type of thing so as a publisher it's a good idea to have one of those yeah, and if you're if you're if you find yourself in that bucket of people who love games, but you know are, are probably like me, right? Thought they were going to be a game designer until they met game designers. Um, uh, a good place for you to start is to um, find a way to get to some of those unpublished or non-published events. There's a lot of events where people are um, looking to pitch their games. Finding game designers with good ideas is easy these days. Um, them finding partners who can help their good idea become a great idea is where people who start game companies can really shine, right? Like you can shine and find games by just making yourself available to play test games that, that designers are working on. If you put yourself out in the community, like I feel like um, uh, my, my buddy Zev started his career um, just play testing games and, and, and networking. And I mean, he didn't, never designed a game in his life, but he was out there networking and finding great games and, and making connections and bringing games from Europe into the United States. There are lots of ways to get into the gaming business without designing your own game from the ground up. Now say I, I'm a designer and I have a really great idea for a game, but I can't do art. What do I do? Uh, are you a game designer who's trying to pitch to publishers? Yeah, or are you I'm a, a, I'm a okay. game designer who's trying to pitch to publishers. I have this really great idea. I've got my okay. figures, but... Then you don't need to really... I mean, there's certain degrees of this. Uh, I know like Richard Lanius will find clip art or found art for because it's not for sale. It's just mm -hmm. for playtest and makes a beautiful, like a stunningly beautiful prototype because he enjoys that. Um, I have signed games that are on index cards and I have signed because they were well thought out index cards. It's just that, but that's what the person had, you know, it wasn't, I just scribbled some stuff down <laughs> and here you go. This is my game design. They came up with five minutes ago, but I've had very well thought out math and how it would match with theme, but not the components. And I've signed ones that somebody spent a lot of extra time and money and effort. And most of those, I was like, awesome. These are great. We're going to redo everything. Uh, yeah. Well, and I felt really bad because that money was in effect wasted. Yeah, when, if, if the game comes with art already done by the designer, I think it kind of somewhat convolutes the conversation about, uh, about compensation for the artist and then reimbursing the designer for what he paid the artist. And it's like, at the end of the day, really, I, I'd rather just use an artist that I'm comfortable with, that I know can really take this even to the next level. Uh, and then that all that art for you, I guess, is a loss. But does that? But do you feel bad about that? And do you want me to compensate you for that, even though we're not going to use it? Like it just convolutes the it, the whole conversation. Right, and and this is different than localization, where you're taking a already printed mm -hmm. or published game from another country, and you're just 
like that's a different conversation yeah, this is a design mm -hmm. that is not published that they want that you have now and now if you are the designer and the artist that might be a different thing because maybe it's so uh chorus quest was the design was uh father and daughter and the art was the daughter oh. it's a a dungeon crawl for kids mm -hmm. it's well. so yeah. stinking adorable very yeah. well done but you know dad's humor is in there mm -hmm. and if you were to sign that and be like but we're going to do our own art that like so there aren't there are exceptions to every rule right. but if you are know that what you're trying to do is pitch a game save your pennies find some clip art yeah. find some you know you know you can do that without spending the money on the art that may or may not be what the publisher yeah, and there's mind. so many resources the noun project is an amazing resource of free clip art the noun project will save so much time in your life actually it might cost you more time way too because like that. there's just so much cool art on the noun project and they're just like fancy clip arts and they're free so you've decided to publish a game maybe you want to go the independent route how how does kickstarter work does kickstarter work for publishing your own game uh, oh, Michael, yeah. it would never work, right? You don't want people kickstarting their own games. It's not, it's not worth it. No, 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 no. No, uh, <clears throat> no, it's best to start actually your own crowdfunding site altogether. <laughs> now, kick, Kickstarter, it obviously has, uh, has proven a, a measurable success in the tabletop gaming space. Oh. So it is a fantastic place. It is still uh, completely viable, even for newcomers to the space um it, it's fantastic kickstarter and just crowdfunding right is just it's the monetization of your social media uh and i think earlier we were, we were chatting and julie made a great point right don't start your marketing don't launch your kickstarter and be and be like now is the time to get the word out right you you've got to build it build it build it start three months six months prior to your launch and start getting that excitement out there uh one and I'll just hit one little thing and I'll let I'll let everybody else talk. I don't want to monopolize this point, but but Kickstarter is our bread and butter and it is what we have completely built our company uh, off of. We are a Kickstarter company at Gamelin Games, um, but something that was very very successful for us from the beginning was uh, and of course it made sense with our tiny Epic Games to offer a free print and play version of our game. Uh, that it was back back when when I first uh, went with that idea, it was kind of a I kind of got inspiration off of the old Diablo game from Blizzard, the, the computer game. They had a shareware version where you could bring your disc over to your friend's house and install the first dungeon. You got to play the first dungeon and you got the village, but that's all you got. Right. But it was enough and you fell in love with it. And then you're like, OK, now that I love it, I need the rest. And then you would go out and you'd buy the rest. And I did worry that in the beginning, if I offered a free print and play version of our tiny Epic game, would that uh, be enough for people to say, cool, I got it, I had fun, that's all I need from it? Or would it inspire people to say, well, now I want all the other factions, now I want the other maps, now I want it fully illustrated. And I found it to be in, in, a, a, a very pivotal part of our success to offer kind of a simplified, uh, version of our tiny epic game as a free format for people to download and play and try and fall in love with the mechanics and the ideas and i did that months prior to launching the kickstarter uh and it, and it really has has paid dividends for the successes of our of our projects we have, we've had a saying at aug since the first collectible trading card game we published um in 1996 Sampling works if your product doesn't suck. So, you know, <laughs> a, free, we, a great <laughs> tiny epic game just means that you want to come back and buy more. And it means that you have um, a belief in your product that you're willing to put it out there and let people play it in advance. Like a lot of people won't even download it and play it. But what that says to people is, I'm not afraid for you to test my game before you buy it. So in addition to that, and of course, going to give a shout out to Tabletop Simulator because print and play is mm -hmm. awesome, but also just being a digital age, if you're able to build something on Tabletop Simulator, 
which is free, um, with their per your membership, which is I think twenty dollars, you can build your game there as well, which is another option for those people who. So you have different ways to go. Um, having a specific place, a, a, whether it's a website, whether it's a Facebook page, whether it's even building your Kickstarter page super early and getting it approved, you do not have to wait until you're ready to launch your Kickstarter to ask to get your Kickstarter approved. Just don't then launch it until you're ready. But you can do that months in advance and have people go to the landing page to sign up that way to be notified well in advance. I recommend not doing that, having either a website or a Facebook page where if you're talk, where you talk about your process because people are going to come and they're going to, the whole point is for Kickstarter is they're investing in you. And if you can show you them, the, the passionate person who loves your product, who feels strongly about it, who's excited about it, who lives and dies by the creation of it, that's going to capture the imagination of a lot more people. And so when they get to the point where you're ready to go live on Kickstarter, you're going to have all these people who are already ready, willing to spread the good word um, for you, which is marketing that cannot be purchased at its, it, it, and is the very best kind. So if you're going to do, do a Kickstarter, don't plan it to go live and then think, well, now what? And I've heard, I've seen so many instances. I saw one today for a Kickstarter that looks amazing and unique and creative that they are 10 days in and are like, so how do I get the word out? And everybody on the forum was like, no, it looks so good. Why did you go live? We would have been able to do stuff for you if you had just given us time, um, kind of a moment. So Michael, once again, is, is channeling my thoughts. Like, yeah, I'm we're, like, we're twinsies wanna, right now. It's great. I know. <laughs> I, and I just want to piggyback on that just a little bit more because I have had a lot of designers, new designers who, who have come to me with a concern about sharing their idea or any sort of iteration of their game with the fear of it being stolen from them. Um, and let me just say that uh, publishers, we are also very creative individuals and we have more game ideas in our heads and in, in our email inboxes than we ever have the time to make, let alone going through the painstaking work of trying to steal your idea uh, and, and the industry is, it's small enough that uh, that kind of stuff doesn't fly and, and it gets recognized quick and, and it will not work and you will be shut down uh, if you're stealing other people's work. So people who are worried about their work being stolen and that is becoming the roadblock for them getting the word out about their game. You got to get over that. You got to get that roadblock out of the way and you just got to share your stuff. Mm -hmm. And that is definitely a new, like when you're new, but it's also the one where, so I like to, I like to think of it as, so when you're a kid, you learn about your house and then you learn about your street and then you learn about your town and then your state or your, you know, and then, and then your country, like, and you, your world slowly expands. When you make your first game, that is your world until you make your next game and your next game. And then suddenly you start seeing the, the bigger picture of the board game wor community world and how much more there is to it. So when it is your world, I get it. It's very precious and it's, it's, it's everything to you. Once you get your next game and your next game, you start realizing it's okay that there are, may have been flaws or it didn't have to be so protected. Um, that it's that's all right um but but you have to get past it and sometimes it takes making designing more games or sometimes you 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 just really you some people come to it quicker than others yeah kickstarter's got a great function called the remind me button right yeah. like if you get your if you get your 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 front page up that says coming to kickstarter in you know spring of 1990 whatever or, you know next year um, you can start your marketing and direct people to that Kickstarter page where they just click the remind me button on that. That remind me button gives you a really good idea of how good your marketing reach is while you're starting to talk about your game. If you're talking a lot about your game, but you're not getting a whole bunch of people signing up for the remind me button, which mm -hmm. 
literally takes them two clicks to do, um, then your marketing may not be reaching people who are going to buy your game. Yeah. And so your first line of marketing, our first line of marketing for Kickstarters is to get people to hit a remind me now button so that we can gauge what our day one is going to look like. Your day one on Kickstarter is so important for 90% of Kickstarters. The path for Kickstarters is, is sort of, um, is, is U-shaped, right? You get the most backers on day one and then it dies down through the middle of the campaign. And then if the campaign is done well, it, 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 it has a U-shape. You get people who are waiting till the end to see how the Kickstarter's done, see what the stretch goals were. And then you get a bunch of people blasting, you know, their, 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 um, their support near the, near the end of a Kickstarter. You seldom see a Kickstarter that starts small and then sort of gradually works its, its, its way up. Those are awesome and they do happen, but that's a dream. You want a good day one because um, only good things can happen after a good day one. Mostly bad things can happen after a bad day one. Statistically, statistically true. Um, I will say the one thing about the remind me button versus a having a like a newsletter sign up or a page, it is a good indicator of who's going to be interested in the first day. Um, but still, even then, it's a you kind of have you can ask around for what the metrics. I don't want to get because we're this is not specific Kickstarter, but talking about the metrics of it and all of that. Um, but one good use of having a newsletter and people signing up is if you are posting to that and giving people updates and giving people information, yes, some people will drop that newsletter before it gets to the Kickstarter point um, because they're getting reminded. But the people who stay, your percentage of people, the turnover is higher than just the remind me button because those people haven't been pinged about your game. So you get people or, and and those people that sign up are also not going to drop the Kickstarter mid campaign or towards the end because some other new shiny Kickstarter comes on. If you've already gotten them to drop off of your newsletter, the people who have remained are the people who are already your dedicated humans. And I will stop there because I could do a whole panel on Kickstarters. Dedicated humans. And that is not yes. this one. The Julie Ahern Kickstarter. <laughs> <laughs> I I feel like Kickstarter alone is a two day convention. It's a convention, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I I think the summary of this conversation for people who are watching the thing is is that if you are interested in getting into the game industry, either as a designer or a publisher, there are a lot of routes to 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 doing so, and um. You know, my, my final word advice would be just start moving in a direction. Yeah. Um, and if you step forward and you take another step and then you change course based on the information that you get, um, sitting around and, and, and sort of thinking about whether you're going to be a designer or a publisher, you know, uh, designers design, right? Like just design your game, get it out there, figure out well, who you're talking to, if you want to be a publisher, get connected, start talking about it, tell people what's what's going on. And, um, you know, the great thing about Kickstarter is um, it is amazing marketing for your game. But more important than that, it is free funding for your game. If you, you don't have to call your parents and say, you know, I want to be, I want to get in the gaming business, you know, will you mortgage your house and, 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 uh, and, you know, help me publish Legend of the Five Rings. You can just go to the world and say, I have this idea. I think it's good. Do you agree with me? And if they do, they will help fund your dream. And if they don't, you just go back to the drawing board and figure out what needs to change and what you need to do. Yeah. There are so many stories of people who, failed once or twice or three times on Kickstarter and then they were overnight successes with their with their fourth game right like it's it, it is um oh that's such a good way to put it mm -hmm. oh yeah. that's so fantastic best I, I always advise people to start small don't yeah. don't don't make this huge game 
start small because then the mistakes are smaller. Everything is smaller. The, the bills are smaller. The shipping cost is smaller. Everything is smaller. So it's pretty much, now granted, we never grew out of that. We started, we just, we got stuck in small. You made it your brand. We never started yeah, with hey, that. Heroes right. of Land, Air, and Steam. Right. Yeah, yes. Yes, here that was the polar. We did kind of just go radically uh, out the opposite. I think that was all the pent up uh, of having <laughs> been so small for so long that we just exploded for Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea. But, but yeah, I always, I always advise new people start smaller. If you have a smaller game that you've been working on, start there. Just cut your teeth a little bit first. Yeah. Or, you know, intern, see if this is a weird thing, but see if there's a publisher that is smaller that you can like shadow or, 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 you know, see if they're willing to share information with how they're, I can tell you there's several, I, I'm, I'm on a, in a group where that is a whole big conversation ongoing all the time. Yeah. So we take on on playtester interns all the time. Yeah. So, yeah. Awesome. Like we take on locals wherever our, our house is located. We have them come and just play test games, and we do um, uh, uh, paid internships for people that will play test yep. our games on Tabletop Simulator. And it is a it is a way for us to find people who might become yeah. the future staff of Alderac Entertainment Group, and yeah. um, and also help us make better games. So. It's a great way to make yourself adjacent to the movers and shakers in the industry. So. Yeah. Well, I think you guys have dropped a whole lot of knowledge. And uh, I, I'm sure uh, anyone watching this panel is going to have questions. Um, where can they find you? guys if uh if they wanted to reach out talk to you bother you maybe not say hey can you blind uh blind pitch a game but <laughs> they might <laughs> we'll start yeah, uh, um gamelandgames.com uh, uh we're on all the social platforms so whatever is your preferred platform check us out gambling games you could just simply google tiny epic and you'll find the breadcrumbs that lead to how to get in touch with us uh if you want to get a hold of me i um uh, we have a, a Facebook group called the Alderac Design Center. Um, we've got 1,200 designers on that um, on that Facebook group. It's mainly a group for designers to, to talk about ideas and, um, and and make their games better. Um, but uh, I, I spend a lot of time on that design center. I just ran a. Um, uh, I'm in the middle of of going through 220 pitches for a pitch project that we ran. For members of the design forum, we talked about how to do a sell sheet, how to do um, uh, videos, and then we took a whole bunch of those in, and I'm going through and I'm slowly critiquing all of them and letting them know what, uh, what what's there. And we had about 30 pitches that we're actually going to take a deeper look at from that from that process. So very um, nice. Uh, you can find me there. That's the easiest place. T. <laughs> I was going to wait for John. <laughs> no. uh, I was like, who's going to? Um, you can find, we are hobbyusa.com is our main website. Um, in you go to the learn more section, we have a lot of information about the company. We also have information about product development uh, because we're also a toy company. So if you have a great idea for a baby rattle, <laughs> uh we do yeah we take our puppets uh dolls we have a lot of stuff we have really cool ball and car tracks anyway uh so you can find information about the company there we also are on twitter or facebook um haba games usa is the game specific social media communities um otherwise if you jump in on our main haba facebook you could be talking about baby rattles or dolls. So if you want to do that, that's fine. But the game specific area, we do have a specific call out. So um, how about Games USA? If you want to talk to me directly, I'm the one tar on Twitter. And Julie. Uh, yeah, so Greenbrier Games is where we are on all the different platforms, www.greenbriargames.com. And I'm going to pitch one, one more time since it is very specific to this panel. Uh, you're invited. We talk about all the topics we talked about and more in depth every Friday on Facebook. Show. So uh, I think it's actually, if you look up live with Rachel and Julie, but you're invited is in the name of the show. It's on YouTube as well. That's where I watch it. And it is, uh, it is on YouTube so that if you don't have time on Friday mornings and don't want to watch it live, you can watch it not live. Well, thank 
all of you for coming out uh, to your rooms for this. Um, I know it's kind of exciting. Hopefully we'll get to do this in person sometime soon. So once again, everyone, I am Meredith Placco. Uh, I do Turbo Dork paints, so you can paint your meeples in really cool colors if you want. Uh, that's what we do. Uh, and I uh, guess we'll be seeing you around. Thanks. <laughs>